Hi everyone, I'm Roz Harvey. I'm the founder and managing director of The Yield and also a director of the Food Agility CRC. Welcome to day two of the Food Agility Summit 2021. Yesterday, we had fascinating insights into carbon markets, the impact on COVID on consumer behaviour, uh, how to make research more industry-led. We also had a terrific overview of the international network of smart farms. So welcome to day two. We're going to be focusing in this panel on agri-tech businesses. They're the key of turning our digital aspirations into reality. And investment is the lifeblood of agri-tech startups and scale-ups. So this panel will explore how we're actually faring in Australia and why. So just first of all, for some stats. According to AgFunder, in 2019, we raised $22.6 billion was invested into global agri-tech startup uh, sector. Australia is roughly 2% of global food production, but it was only 0.4% of global agri-tech investment. So if we were investing proportionally to our agri-food production, we should have raised five times as much as we did, injecting an extra half a billion dollars of investment into Australian agri-tech startups and scale-ups. So what's going wrong? That's what we're going to be exploring today. And we have a fabulous panel for you. We have three of Australia's leading ag tech investment uh, 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 funds, and we have three founders from some of our leading ag tech businesses that are startups and scaling up. So first of all, I'm going to introduce you to each of these. And what I'd ask each of our panelists to do is, as I introduce you, if you could just let the audience know how much you have invested in ag tech, if you're a VC fund, and conversely, as founders, how much you've raised in capital. So Matt, we're going to start with you. You're the co-founder and partner of Tenacious Ventures. How much have you invested in agri-tech business here in Australia? Oh, hey, Ros. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, yeah, we're pretty, we're sort of new kid on the block as far as VC funds are concerned. We've only been uh, investing for actually, it's exactly a year today, as it turns out. Uh, and we've invested approximately $5 million uh, in that in that period out of a total committed uh, fund size of 35. Thanks. And Phil, Phil Moyle, who's a partner in, from Main Sequence Ventures, how much has your fund invested in agri-tech businesses? Oh, you're, you're a meanie pants, Ross, <laughs> but thanks for having me on this uh, on this session. Um, I actually don't know what the actual number is, but it must be somewhere between 20 and 30 million out okay. of our $240 million fund. We'll call it 30 million. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Robert, uh, Robert Williams, who's the director of, Ag, of Agri-Food, the Artesian Investment Fund. How much have yeah. you invested, Rob? Thanks, Roz. So we would have raised, uh, we would have invested between uh, five and 10 mil of 60 mil committed uh, for Agri-Food VC. Fantastic. And so let's now turn to the, our founders um, of some of Australia's leading agri-tech businesses and scale-ups, starting with you, Emma. How much have you guys actually raised in AgriDigital? Yep, so AgriDigital started back in 2015 and we've raised around about 11 million Aussie um, over that time. Fantastic. And Justin Webb, who's the founder and executive chair of AgriWeb. Agri, uh, so Justin, how much have you guys raised? Thanks for having us on, Ross. Um, the, uh, we've raised about 46 million. Fantastic. And Tim Neal, who's the founder and the managing director of Data Farming. Hey, Roz. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, we've raised two million. Okay. So just a quick telling up of this. We've had 45 million from this panel of people investing in, in agri-tech businesses. And we've had 57, 58, nearly 60 million from our panelists. If you add the yield who's raised 33, it's probably about 100 million. So... I suppose the key thing about here is the collective wisdom of this panel is underscored by the amount of, of funds that we've both raised and invested at about $150 million. So it's really such a great pleasure to have you all here and have this such deep expertise that we're now drawing on. So 
we're going to have a bit of a slightly different sort of process to this panel. Um, and what we're going to be doing is breaking it into three sort of themes that we'll be talking to our panellists about. The first theme is about Australian unicorns, you know, as we hinted, hunting for unicorns. The second is about how we need to access later stage capital. And thirdly, how agri-tech businesses themselves are going in terms of demonstrating their value proposition and making them investment ready. Now, as part of setting each of these three themes up, what I'm going to be doing is asking each of the panellists two questions, they, and they can only give a yes-no answer. And it's really, I know these questions are very complex, and yes-no is a little bit trivialising it, but in some ways what I'm wanting to do is just get a straw poll of what, what our panellists think, and also you, the audience. So at the same time that I'm asking the panellists, you can also participate in the online um, voting that we've set up with this system. So let's just kick off here on our first theme where we're really looking at this question of Australian unicorns. So the question that I'm going to be asking is, do you think we'll see an Australian-born ag tech unicorn in the next 10 years? So Phil, let's just start with you. And, and you're no cheating here. You have to say yes, no. <laughs> yes. Yes. And Matt, what do you think? Yes. Rob? Yes. Okay, Emma. Yes. Tim. Yes, we've already got one. We've got a few, haven't we? <laughs> yes. Uh, and Justin. Yes. Great. And let's just see what our audience is saying at the same time. Uh, we've got overwhelming agreement with the panel. 92% of our audience think the answer is actually yes. So now I'm going to have a slight variation on this question. And is, do you think that we will see an Australian agri-tech unicorn headquartered here in Australia in the next 10 years? So let's just go through the same, uh, same system. So the difference is between being born here and actually still being here and headquartered and running their global unicorn from here. So, Phil, what do you think? Yes. Matt? No. Rob? Yes. Emma? Yes. Tim? Yes. Justin? No. Okay, we've got a slightly different divergence here. And similarly, our audience is saying the same. We've got 64% saying yes and 35%, sorry, I'm looking down here at the screen, 35% saying no. So we've got a slightly different sort of set of answers here. So what I'd really like to do is to drill into that a little bit. Let's just, first of all, starting um, with you, uh, Matt, you said no. Why, why do you think that we, we won't have an agri-tech unicorn actually headquartered here? Everyone agrees we're going to have them born here, but clearly every, there's a, a divided opinion about whether they'll actually stay to actually grow their businesses here. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Rose. It's, it's, it's a good question and, and actually a, a good challenging question because, um, you know, it cuts right to the heart of, of our desire to kind of see success, Australian success stay, Australian success. Um, and I think that, that that is a really good thing. When you think about, though, you know, in this this unicorn status company, a company that's generating, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue, it's especially in agri-food innovation uh, as a you know, provider of products and services in that space, very, very difficult to see how you could get to that level of scale uh, with Australia as, a, as your major market. So it's, it's much more likely that even though the company would have its roots and hopefully a you know, significant portion of operations still here, it's just through the kind of realities of where the capital is going to come from and where the major uh, kind of revenue markets and major partnership markets, right? So to get to hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue isn't just growth on your own. It's, it's formation of strategic partnerships. It's, you know, striking of, of big deals. It's rolling out of, of large amounts of a kind of people and infrastructure. And it just seems much more likely that that large footprint um, is going to be, you know, in, a, in an economy, in an agriculturally productive economy that's scale appropriate. You know, okay. it could be North America, could be Southeast Asia, could be China, um, could be South, you know, South America for that matter. Um, but I think just the weight of numbers would, would make it much more likely that eventually the kind of combined pressure of customer, big customer pressure and big investor pressure would 
see it more likely than not that uh, HQ would move. Okay, great. Thanks, Matt. So, Emma, you disagree with Matt. What do you think? Why do you think that they'll actually still be, you know, there will be examples of unicorns being headquartered here? Look, I think Matt's made really, you know, good points. And the, these are the points that we need to be wary of as we're building out an ag tech ecosystem um, and a concentration of, of ag techs um, in Australia um, is, is all the reasons why ag techs might want to move. But the reason that I'm optimistic is that I think two things. One, we underestimate, you know, as Bill Gates said, what we can uh, achieve in 10 years and we often overestimate what we can achieve in two. So I'm just, you know, eternally optimistic about the time period that you gave, Roz, um, around what can be done. But I also think that at a practical level, the world has changed um, post-COVID and that there are opportunities and an understanding around how to build digitally-based businesses that have global scale um, and if, you, if we want to say choose to headquarter them in Australia and that's where, um, you know, the, the leading um, or deciding mind of the business is, if that's what we mean by that term, I think that is possible. Um, and I think there's some great examples that are starting to emerge. Um, you know, there, there's my fellow, fellow panellists are, are, are right up there amongst them. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic uh, that, that we can grow and retain um, our, our ag tech ecosystem here in Australia. Okay, great. So, Phil, you agree with Emma. Is, uh, is your thinking yeah. similar? Yeah, it is. I, I, there's no doubt that, that any ag tech company is going to need to have a significant amount of its operation, most of it, in fact, uh, overseas, because that's where most of the market is. And a lot of this work is about getting down onto the, onto the soil, onto the ground. But I think if we, if we, um, if we are looking for an, uh, more unicorns in Australia, then ag is one of the sectors where we can really have a shot at it because we've got such great raw materials here. We've got a great agricultural sector. Uh, we've got an emerging investor group. We've got some great uh, technology here on the ground. Uh, and, um, and and I think we can do it. And, and I think like Emma, there's been a I've observed a massive shift in the last year where people, that's customers and investors, are much more comfortable having uh, a head office here on the ground and doing business without actually spending time with people. And companies have had to adjust as well. Companies have had to find sales channels without being on the ground. Okay. So, Phil, just a follow-up question on that, though. That half a billion dollar difference that we need to make up if we were getting the proportional amount mm. that we should from global, is that going to come out of Australia with these headquartered businesses or is that going to come out internationally but allowing headquartered businesses to stay here? I think a lot more is going to come out of Australia. We've got a maturing investor market now around agri-food. And uh, but I do think uh, local companies are always going to have to spend some quality time building an international investor network for themselves. Yeah. OK. So, Rob, um, obviously, your fund's a very important investor in this scene. You know, do you agree with uh, Phil's observations or what more would you sort of add to this? Do you think that we should be looking to to fill this half a billion dollar gap? Yeah. So I think. Um I think, you know, Phil made a, a good point in that, you know, there is uh, a growing, um, I guess, investor set that, uh, you know, are, are actively participating, you know, at various different ends of the investment spectrum. I think the, the other thing that I'd add to that as well is, you know, we're starting to see, you know, further support from industry in particular. And, you know, one of the partnerships that, um, you know, we've developed alongside uh, GRDC to set up a, a dedicated you know, venture industry support program for grains in Australia is, you know, a good example of that playing out. I think we're starting to see, you know, further support on the, the government and infrastructure side, particularly around um, industry aligned grant opportunities that are, are continuing to, I guess, provide domestic support and, and potentially um, give companies the, the comfort to you know, anchor their operations um, going forward locally. I think the other thing that is interesting to flag, you know, for us at Artesian, we have a, a key regional focus across the broader Asia Pacific region. Mm. And I think, you know, for an area like agri-food where, you know, in Australia, we're, we're very strong in terms of the, the upstream, you know, ag tech, um, you know, production uh, opportunity. Um, we've got supply chain access through into broader Asia and then, you know, uh, with that, with that, I guess regional positioning, we have access to a, a large and growing consumer set, you know, across broader Asia. That I think, 
gives Australia a, a really you know, interesting um, advantage you know, in looking to you know, develop close ties and supply chain links into the region, which I think over time will you know, help to support businesses um, you know, in Australia, uh, looking to stay in Australia and, and grow regionally as opposed to um, you know, uh, purely internationally um, you know, over the medium term. Okay, great insight. So I, I'm going to throw it over now to, to Justin, who said no, and Tim will come back to you for the last word, so get ready for it. Um, so, Justin, you said no. Um, what's your thinking, you know, in terms of the way you're looking at these issues? <laughs> well, Tim, I sympathise with you. It's always tricky to, um, to come in after everyone else. But, um, uh, you know, Matt made some great points um, that I won't reiterate, but I think that early stage, we're incredible at, at, at coming up with brilliant companies um, and getting investment because there's quite a pioneering attitude, both in, in the professional investors in terms of VCs, but also in, in private markets and high net worth. But as, as a company really is scaling, I think there are three sort of uh, a push and pull that, that takes, uh, takes them internationally. You know, one, the collaboration argument. I know we've slightly touched on it, but in order to get to as Matt said, you know, 100 million plus of revenue a year, you usually typically have to start collaborating with established players in the industry. And, ag and agriculture is one that has a few very large players like uh, Cargill, Zoetis, Merck, Boehringer, Ingelheim, et cetera. And almost all of those exist, uh, not here. So um, going over to the United States, to Brazil, to Europe, uh, it, in order to facilitate those collaborations in the markets that are most important to them, I think is a prospective cornerstone. Um, and ultimately, there is an attractiveness, notwithstanding the comments about the world changing, of having headquarters you know, closer to, to their home bases. Um, the second thing is, I think, the ability to collaborate and cluster. Um, as the industry is evolving here in Australia, you know, the companies that have gone overseas are starting to collaborate more readily. Indeed, as, as you well know, Ros, um, those of us that are starting to, to extrapolate um, our markets and our products into other countries, you know, we're starting to work together almost because we're pioneering into those new markets. And so therefore, it offers a an ability or a playing field for us to tie up together. I think we're not doing nearly as good a job of gathering together and collaborating here in Australia in the slightly earlier stages. So again, to reach scale by clustering, sharing, I think that there's real opportunity for us to try to do that. And perhaps that will um, secure more growth further down the line. And the last is around opportunities to exit. Now, obviously the definition of a unicorn is that it is still a private company. But um, looking at, say, Farmer's Edge, uh, just listing in on the Canadian stock market a couple of weeks ago for 800 million, um, you know, very close to being a unicorn, and then immediately so jumping 23% on, on the first day of the IPO, there is a clear demonstration of interest to invest from the public markets. And so as one starts to reach that scale, I think there is an attractiveness to be based in markets where one can list into public markets um, or indeed, you know, have trade sales uh, that are more uh, common and prevalent. Okay, great. Thanks very much for that. Now, I'm going to come back to it because indeed, um, of all the companies that we know who are in this scale-up stage, so there's probably, you know, maybe a dozen Australian ag tech businesses at a scale-up stage, and we are talking about most of those actually choose to have their production, like their, their data science and their engineering, their product teams based here in Australia. And I think that's a really interesting opportunity. But um, let's just, Tim, you know, your reflections on this now. You, you're, you're lucky last, so you get to hear what everyone else has said. Mm -hmm. So have you got any anything yeah. additional insight or commentary on, on what you've heard? Yeah, I'd reiterate the comments uh, from Emma about being optimistic and, <laughs> and from Robert saying that there is other opportunities here. I think, uh, to me, the, the key... I think the key paradigms are, are going to change. So, you know, the paradigm was that you have to follow the money into the US and I don't I don't think that's going to continue. Um, I think that there's going to be far more interest out of, out of the Southeast Asian region and subcontinent um, and South America, as, as um, was pointed out earlier. So I, I think, uh, you know, the optimism is that we can still be based here and, and work in the global market and, and Southeast Asia is certainly a lot closer and I, 
I just think those old paradigms are going to change with the changing nature of investment in ag tech and the modernization of agriculture in in those areas with vast numbers of people and um, vast numbers of farmers. So I think that's that's what's really going to drive change. And I think the North American market's going to be left wondering after a few years about what happened. Um, I, I think uh, you know, what I'm seeing is the rapid rapid changes in the in the Asian and uh, African markets uh, way quicker than, than anywhere else in the world. Yeah, really interesting. Incredibly interesting discussion. So if I had to summarise, summarise it, I, I think the aspiration probably of every Australian um, ag tech scale up and start up is to keep their headquarters here. Um, and what's pulling that offshore is, you know, being obviously closer to the markets um, and all of those collaboration opportunities, clearly, uh, and investors. But it's very interesting to think about, you know, what are the pull factors we can create to the to here in Australia to keep companies anchored. And, and listening to you, I think there's a lot of optimism across the panel that this is possible, but it may take a concerted effort. Uh, and I think, you know, interestingly, the comments about regional markets and places other than US, particularly where we can fill this funding gap, because, you know, half a billion dollars is not a little, uh, little number to fill. And so, you know, we really need to be quite innovative about how we both attract investment from places like the States, but also to perhaps tap other, um, tap other investment markets uh, and, and consumer markets. But, you know, a, a continuing theme I often hear from early stage businesses is the incredible value that we get from working with very innovative grower groups, whether they be corporate or individual farmers. And this gives us an enormous sort of opportunity. So a really interesting discussion, but and also a good segue in some ways. Um, one of the things that we really understand is that unicorns really need to be better at, um, they need access to later stage capital. And we know from the Ag Funder report that 34, there was a 34% lift in investment in agri-tech businesses in 2020. So that was a massive lift, um, in some ways I think spurred by COVID. But at the same time, that was predominantly in later stage funding. And I suppose the question to this panel now is, do unicorns need, a, need later stage uh, capital? And we have two questions. So same methodology where I'm going to ask each of the panellists and at the same time, our audience can vote online and we can compare what the panellists think compared to, with, to what, the, uh, what, what our... Um, our uh, participants actually are, are seeing. So the first question, and Phil, again, we'll kick off with you. Australia is good at early stage venture funding, but bad for Series B and beyond. Yes, no? No. Hmm, okay. Matt? Oh, I want to shift the time signature here, but I'm going to say no. Okay. And so we're saying, no, it's not true. So we're equally, the people who are saying, no, you're saying you're equally good at Series B and beyond as we are as early stage. So um, Rob, what's your view? Is Australia as good as early stage funding, um, but bad for Series B and beyond? Yes, no. True, false? Uh, yes, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Emma. Australia is good at early stage venture funding, but bad for series and beyond. True or false? Well, I thought you were going to say yes, no, Roz, and I was going to say yo. Um, <laughs> that's cheating. So <laughs> that's cheating. True, Look, false. I'm I'm going to say false um, when we look at the complexion. But if we bring it back to agri food, I might say something different. You can't have bets both ways in these questions. So I'm going to put you down as a false. Australia is good at early stage venture funding with bad for Series B and beyond. Um, Tim, true, yeah, false? Uh, true. Justin? True, but it's moving. It's evolving. Okay. And I'm just having a look at what our audience is saying. Um 59% are saying true and 41% are saying false. So actually, it's, it's really interesting here. Our panellists and our audience are very aligned. It'll be interesting as we go through our session whether that continues. So our next question is, and um, valuations are higher in other markets um, like US and Australia. True, false. Phil? True. Matt? True. Rob? True. Emma? True. Tim? True. Justin? True. 
Okay, and we're looking at what our uh, audience is saying, and it's still coming through. So just while it's coming through, ah, here we come. 80% are saying true and 20% are saying false. So what's really interesting in this is we have a mixed opinion as to whether we can access later stage funding here in Australia. Um, you know, roughly, probably slightly in favour of, of those saying that it's hard to access. Um, but nearly everyone agrees on the panel, at least, that the valuations are lower. So really what I want to drill into in the discussion is do we have a supply-demand problem? Is there enough supply of venture uh, funding for post Series B, but perhaps because of the difference in these valuations, that valuations are higher in other markets, there's a very big pool to go elsewhere. Um, and it would seem to me that that's going to, you know, perhaps underlies what some of this, this debate is all about. So um, let's dive on in. I'm going to start this time with Rob. You said that, yes, it's true that it's harder to get early stage uh, funding. Do you want to just explain your experience on that and why you think that's the case? Well, I, I think, um, you know, what can be said generally is, you know, the, there's an ecosystem that's been, you know, built um, within Australia. And I think, you know, when you look globally, uh, we are, you know, lagging uh, behind. That can, I think, pretty truly be said at this stage, um, noting that, you know, things have, you know, moved and developed uh, in a good direction over the last three or four years. Um, but I think what's worth noting is that, you know, we think that um, uh, ecosystems, you know, need to be built from the bottom up. And, you know, that's what's, you know, that's what everyone's trying to achieve, I think, at the moment. Certainly, you know, we've focused our strategy on being able to, you know, broadly deploy capital early stage um, as, I guess, one part of the investment process, but then there's the later stage piece as well, and, and that does um, come later. And I think, you know, while the, you know, agri-food tech startup scene is, you know, being developed from the bottom up, the same can be said on the investor side. I think, you know, we've got... Um, you know, a, a large list of uh, organisations, investors that are keen to engage, but, you know, we need to be able to deliver relevant opportunities at the right stage um, that, you know, uh, meet the, the requisite, you know, re requirements of those parties. And I think naturally that takes time. So I think, you know, we're, we're heading in the right direction, but there's um, a degree of patience uh, required to see that, you know, develop properly. Okay. So, Emma, if Rob is right and this capital is going to keep building that we can access, you know, past Series A, if you, you, you believe that we've got better valuations, you can achieve better valuations for your investors elsewhere, is that going to be enough? Or is the valuation gap going to be what um, pulls agri-tech businesses from Australia into other markets such as the US? Look, you'd like to think not, Roz. Um, you know, you'd you'd like to think that um, it wasn't valuations alone that were that were driving that type of behaviour. Um, but I do think that if we're going to get serious about building out, you know, an investment-based ecosystem as well as a startup scale-up-based ecosystem here in Australia, then investors are going to have to get comfortable writing bigger checks throughout the life cycle, um, you know, of an of an ag tech. And um, we might get onto it later, but that investment cycle and that product cycle may not be completely attuned to what those investors are used to investing in, in other types of products. And so I think there's um, a maturity phase that we're going through, and I would hope that that will see, um, you know, more of an equalisation um, over time. But the reality is, at the moment, it feels like, um, from our perspective, that investors are still very much focused on uh, what ag techs are doing in the Australian market and are not seeing, despite what we've all said on this panel, mm -hmm. are not seeing um, and putting their money behind the global potential of the Australian ag tech um, ecosystem at this point or, or specific ag techs. But I think, you know, Justin and, and the team at AgriWeb have just done a fantastic raise, um, you know, which is a real, you know, shot in the arm for the um, for, for all of us, which is fantastic. But I think this is the type of capital it's going to take. Um, and, you know, Justin, I hope you don't mind me pointing to you, but, you know, that capital largely did not come from Australia. Um, so, 
you know, no, these you are totally the questions preempted that... me, Emma. That's exactly what I was about <laughs> to ask him: where where his capital actually came from and why there than elsewhere. But have, don't let me cut you off. Have you, have you finished, or did you have any? No, more to I, I'm straight over to Justin. If that was the segue. <laughs> okay, so Justin, you've just raised thirty million. Congratulations! It's an amazing outcome, not only for your own business, but also because it, it provides uh, a kind of lighthouse of what's possible. So really, really tr tremendous outcome. A Series B round. Um, did it, what proportion of that money came from Australia versus overseas and how, how do you think this is playing out, this later stage capital? You said that um, it was true that Australia is not very good at, at post-Series uh, A and you've just lived it. So, you know, it'd be great to share some of your experience with us all. Um, well, <laughs> Emma, thank you very much and, and Roz as well. Um, you know, I suppose <clears throat> uh, selling selling bits of one's company is is it's probably not the thing to be to be congratulated on. <laughs> um, hopefully, it, it's what one what we can do with it to accelerate the growth. But um, yeah, uh, you know, the the investors in this round um, were majority came from a corporate venture capital um, that was from Canada. Um, in fact, a telco uh, called Telus. It's very similar to. Um, in scale and and proliferation in country in Canada to Tel uh, Telstra here, um, and they've made a really concerted effort into um, investing into and advancing uh, and acquiring companies in the ag tech space. Um, and the you know the enormous attractiveness to that, which we haven't really seen here, is the uh, the ability for a big corporate like that to start to pull together different pieces of the puzzle and create a sort of sum that's greater than parts. And, and that was very attractive. And um, in fact, we saw that in our series A as well, where we raised 14 million um, from uh, the, uh, the Wheat Sheaf Group, which is a part of, it's a subset of a private family office based in the UK. And they similarly had created a VC that was specific to the ag tech space. Um, and then finally, we did have a portion that was from Australia, um, um, both our original angel investors um, who had followed us in, in, uh, through every, every element of our round, and the vast majority of that comes from Australian capital. And the second part was the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. And obviously, they're um, very well backed by the Australian government and have a very singular focus on reducing uh, carbon emissions, which is a, a fantastic initiative and I, I hope becomes a central tenement to ag tech generally. Um, all of that said, coming back to the question of, of why you know, going overseas, um, I, I think that there is an attractiveness of Australian ag tech, and, and <clears throat> I'm going to pinch Matt's uh, co-founder's words here. Um, Sarah Nolan sort of was, uh, wrote in, in a blog, if there was a startup Olympics, um, uh, Australia would you know, probably maybe even not make the Olympics in, in fintech or consumer tech, et cetera, just purely from the scale of our market. But when you, um, when you look across to ag tech, we'd be right up there on the podium. Mm -hmm. um, we've got one of the most diverse agricultural landscapes and, um, and, and, and you know, the, the different markets that one has to compete in to um, temper and prove your product, such that when you do go global, you've got almost a tried and tested um, uh, you know, demonstration to take to the world. So when you do walk up to Sand Hill Road, the, the famous VC, um, hotspot in in Silicon Valley, or if you're you know pitching to ag tech specific VCs in the Midwest or in London, you've got a much more demonstrated ability in a market that you know has proven itself as one of the biggest exporters of grain, beef, lamb, and um, and so I think that's a really powerful thing. That necessarily hasn't quite aligned yet with. Um, the the fast growing VC space here, which is really just starting to capture investment itself from the superannuation funds. And up until very recently, it sort of had a um, the VC landscape here has had a be global first approach, which doesn't necessarily align with ag tech and the growth, which might need to prove its product locally before exporting domestically, uh, exporting internationally. Um, and I think that, you know, that's why the answer is yes, but it's shifting. I think as that evolves, that's great. The other thing is ultimately agriculture, and um, Emma, Emma alluded to this, ag tech is a slightly slower, longer burn. Um, you know, we want these markets to evolve. We want our businesses to evolve, but it's, it's not Snapchat. Um, it's, it's a smaller market. It's a longer proof cycle. 
And so therefore, the stickiness is incredibly attractive from, say, a SaaS perspective. Uh, but the evolution is, is you know, sometimes is a juxtaposition with the seven-year horizon of a VC fund that can't necessarily you know, ride out the longer growth cycle and is looking for a quicker shot of growth. Very, very interesting um, set of points there as well. Um, before I, I turn back to uh, Phil and Matt, I just thought, I'd, Tim, you know, um, get your perspective on. Obviously, you're at an, at an earlier stage of in, in, in capital raising, uh, and so you know, I'm interested to see where you're looking. Uh, are you looking in the Australian market? Is that where your investment has come from? Uh, and how do you think about this problem as you look forward? Oh, I guess it's just a numbers game. It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? I mean, the, there's just not the size of, of and volume of of capital in the Australian market. So when you start writing bigger checks, like Emma said, I mean, it's just not there. So uh, it's just simply a numbers game. And, and, and historically, agriculture has not been on anyone's radar. Like uh, a couple of years ago, I mean, we, we, were, we were fighting gas companies to try and get people, workers back into agriculture. I mean... There was a 10-year drought, not only a drought in, in rainfall, there's a 10-year drought in people and, and, and interest in agriculture. It was a huge gap. Mm. And we were one of the crazy ones to go through that gap. And then all of a sudden it becomes everyone's cool kid on the block is ag tech. And, and so then it's, it's like a bees oh. to the honeypot and there's just more and more coming. But, you know, there's still a long way to go in that whole space. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so, yes, uh, most of our funds up until now have been coming from... Um, from Australia. Um, however, uh, we're certainly getting a lot more interest internationally now um, mm -hmm. to take our product global. So, um, you know, I think that the, the, there's certainly uh, much bigger checkbooks in other countries than what we're going to actually find in Australia. So we might just have to concede on that for the moment. But, you know, the interest is certainly coming, um, uh, you know, thick and fast. And there's, there's people every day I talk to that are just starting on this whole thing. Oh, we've heard about this ag tech and, you know, investors that are really keen on, on doing it when I thought, you know, sort of we'd meet, we'd reached a maturity point, but there's still a long way to run there. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because all, all the founders who are on the panel today are, are saying that they're quite, you know, optimistic. They think it's changing in a way. That's the narrative here is that, yes, it's behind, but it's it's changing. It's possible to affect this. And, you know, remember, we've got this half a billion dollar gap if we're, we're using that as the number. And I think it's great that uh, Phil, Phil and Matt, you both are, are saying that, no, it's not true, that we can access post um, series A uh, uh, capital, but at the same time, you're saying the valuations are potentially higher elsewhere. So um, I'm really interested in, in uh, and, and let's start with uh, fuel first this time. You know, why do you are you so confident that this extra, you know, capital can be can be accessed, and that the higher valuations won't pull the deals offshore? Or will they just change the valuations here um, in time that the markets will align? What, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's. I think what we're looking at here is is almost entirely a timing issue mm. that that our ecosystem is maturing, um, and I, that's the the startup ecosystem itself, the investor ecosystem, and the ag ecosystem, and the kinds of companies that can be made. So I think when we're looking at at, at capital amounts invested, what we're seeing is earlier stage companies being funded. And now what's happening is we're starting to get the compound interest of a global market emerging, connectivity starting to happen. Um, even if we just look at the investor uh, market here in Australia, you know, some of you know that I started uh, the first accelerator here in Australia called Pollinizer in 2008. Uh, back then, the entire venture capital pool in Australia was smaller than our fund today. Wow! It was awful. It was a desert to try and mm -hmm. to try and raise money. Today, that's that's very different. There's billions of dollars under management, and but it's not just about the amount of money. It's about how that capital is operating and how people are collaborating. So again, if you look at if you look at, you know, Robert and Matt and I, we're all co-investing. Mm. We're, we're learning about how we pass companies up through the life cycle towards bigger and bigger rounds. As these companies mature, 
the companies are solving massively valuable problems in multi, certainly multi-billion dollar, if not multi-trillion dollar markets. So as we get more and more mature, these are not risky investment propositions. They're, they're infrastructure for a modern world that's making food differently for, for more and more people over increasing adverse conditions. Mm. Um, and so I think it's just a maturity thing. We're going to we're going to see companies get bigger. We're going to see the investor community get better and more sophisticated at investing together and collaboratively. You know, let's be clear: um, Australian ag tech companies must get overseas investment. We we shouldn't design the system to only be coming from local investors. I mean, what, what I hope we can do is create a world where local investors have more and more money, more and more sophistication, can help more and more, can help connect those companies with global markets. And one of the ways we do that is we collaborate with global investors. investors. Yeah, and no. that's not just investors that are on our level. It's, it's, you know, what we all do very well now, I think, is we work with our LPs, our investors, who have much bigger pockets and they're investing in us so that we pass companies up. And we're just gonna, we're gonna see more than that. We're gonna see a lot more of that. I think that's a really good point because of that half a billion dollar gap we're trying to fill, it doesn't need to all come out of the Australian market. What we want is that there's enough anchoring investment in Australia that we're not pulling all these companies offshore. I think this is probably the mm. nuance around the discussion. Mm. But you know, taking this um, idea of the Olympics uh, that uh, Matt, your, your uh, 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 co-founder, sort of, you know, coined this analogy if that, that ag tech were in the Olympics, you know, we would be selected because we're just so good at agriculture and ag tech. Um, do we have a situation where if we were a relay team, uh, businesses are out in front and investors aren't, are a little bit behind so we're not able to actually hand on the baton to make sure that they're actually being supported and, and as a team being able to get over the line? Is, is that the problem we're facing? No, I don't think so. I think Phil nailed it. It's a bit like the, the weather in Melbourne, right? If you don't like it, wait a few hours. I mean, <laughs> you know, you've got to remember that four years ago, there wasn't even a, a dedicated ag tech fund in Australia. And so I think it's, um, it's pretty easy to underestimate the amount of momentum that is building in the ecosystem now. And, and everybody that's on this call is part of that development. Actually, Ros, I think the... The reason why there was so much over under, you know, uh, bet hedging in the answers to your original question coming into this section was that it's it's very very difficult to sort of you know talk about a sort of concrete setting for the ag uh, for the ecosystem right now because it really is evolving very quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're, you know, I, I just couldn't be more hopeful. Um, I think the two my you know my kind of two takeaways from this part would be that we understand that it is a global market. So we talked about that and, and this, these disparities we will see disappear and blend. And, and a lot of that, yes, will be a benefit of COVID that we just kind of starting to really lose this, you know, kind of geographic, um, uh, you know, fencing off mm -hmm. of, of deals and mm -hmm. that'll have a leveling across the board and, and create much, much greater collaboration. But I think the second really important point is that, we talk all the time about the $60 billion in, of export in, in food and fiber products, but we don't talk about or, or specifically aspire to tens of billions of dollars in exported products and services around agri-food innovation. When we decide we want to own that, then you know, it'll just drive the momentum even faster. And I think we have to see those two things sitting side by side. Of course, it needs investment to get there, but ultimately we want that investment because we want to participate in a 500 to 700 billion dollar global market for products and services in agri-food tech. Yep. Fantastic. You know, I'm going to as the chair of this panel slightly diverge from the you know from the way I was intending to run it because I was intending at this point to move on to ask whether, you know, ag techs are good at getting investment ready. But, you know, listening to the conversation that we've had, I think there's a much more interesting conversation to have. And, and that is really because what I'm hearing is from founders and from um, investors is that we're really at a bit of an inflection point. There's an incredibly strong interest and demand, if you like, from the ag tech companies to both be 
born global. I think, Emma, you often talk about companies being born global, um, but also to keep a very strong uh, connection into the Australian market. You know, most of us want to keep our whole production teams here, which is where the data science and the, the engineering and all the smarts are. And at, on the other side, we're hearing from in the investment community that really we're a bit of an inflection point where this traditional hurdle of us being all pulled offshore, um, you know, because there wasn't the sort of support, if you like, and then when we didn't have these cornerstone investors in Australia, the risk was that there wasn't a lot holding us here. So we've got, I suppose, a... A uh, oh, terrible hackneyed phrase, a coalition of the willing, but that's what it feels like. Um, and at the same time, if we think about the CRC and some of the things that are happening in the ecosystem more generally, this push to try and make us better at, at translation of research and getting it into companies and getting it to market fast. So I suppose the question I thought we could usefully spend our, our sort of last sort of 15 minutes on instead is what can we do? do as a community, as an ecosystem, as a community, to accelerate what you're all describing is happening, but maybe a little bit slow, a little bit out of sync. Um, what can we actually do working collectively? Because I think I've heard you all use this word about how important it is to collaborate and use an ecosystem approach. What should we be doing um, in partnership with governments to actually really capitalise on this incredible opportunity we have to capture, and I think, Matt, you talked about a figure of $550 billion of ag tech services. You know, what, what can we do to actually capture that and, and hold it here and learn not only for the agricultural and food community, but also to create these new knowledge um, um, services and products of the future? So, Matt, I might segue to you first, because I know you're involved in the Agritech Association as well and where you've been thinking about this question a lot. Yeah, I mean, so, so I think we, we need to decide that we want uh, a sector that's dedicated to agri-tech as, as opposed to agriculture. It's, it's directly in support of, and, and really important, it's, it's widely acknowledged that, you know, further development and adoption of technology will help, you know, improve and drive the Australian farm gate output uh, toward its, its, its target of $100 billion. So that's a, that's a $20 billion uplift that we're looking for. But as evidenced by all the awesome founders on this call, you know, there's a global opportunity and we have to decide that we're going after that and, and resource it and invest in it. So, you know, my answer to your question, what can people do? Ring up your super fund and demand that all of your super get invested in sustainable agriculture and technology that supports sustainable agriculture. Ring up your local state and federal members and demand that when they're looking at job creation, when they're looking at training and education, that, that they primarily focus their efforts around, you know, what Australia is globally good at, which is agriculture and innovation that supports agriculture globally. And those should be our two top national priorities across the board. Okay. And this may be sort of key to this translation issue. Um, can I turn to you, Tim, first? You know, have you got any views about, you know, what you think we can be doing to more capitalise on this, this incredible capability we have, but um, to really grow an ag tech sector in Australia? Yeah, we, we all say we want to work together more, as we've all said. But what I find happening is that we're, we're competing more because there's a limited amount of funds and thing, um, you know, um, access to capital here in Australia that that we're actually competing more than what we should be it, it's crazy you know we, we we should be joining uh, forces a lot more and, and the companies I talk to about this alignment sort of issue all share the same uh, frustrations I guess um, but also a willingness to actually form alliances to take on um, the world together rather than uh, individually because just due to size uh, of each other's buckets, basically. Um, so I think whilst we keep saying we want to work together, I think uh, there's not much evidence of that, to be honest. I think there's a lot of competition. And, you know, the competition um, comes from all levels, um, not just in private enterprise, um, but we're all basically competing over the same funds. And so that's got to end to actually get a unified front um, because really... The disadoption or non-adoption is the is the competitor, not us individually. That's hmm. very insightful, um, uh, Rob. What what's your view about this? Do we can we do more than we're doing? Yeah, I think. Look, to start with, um, 
you know, everyone on the call today, it's, it's a great example of, I guess, you know, leading by doing firstly as practitioners. And we all obviously need to, to keep focused on, you know, the opportunity available to us. But I think uh, collectively there's probably um, an opportunity to, uh, you know, better describe uh, the potential available returns from um, agri-food tech as a sector more broadly. Mm. Um, you know, they're broken into a number of categories and it's something that, you know, we we think about, you know, regularly. Um, you know, those include obviously the, the financial returns. So, you know, the ability of, of companies, um, you know, like the, the, the businesses panel today go out and, and build, you know, really large scalable businesses that can demonstrate, you know, a venture track record in the sector um, in Australia. I think there's being able to, you know, describe the strategic opportunity that exists for other participants, uh, you know, within the ecosystem um, uh, to, you know, engage with agri-food tech. So that, you know, being able to describe uh, the value you know that, that corporates and industry participants in particular can um, can gain access to by you know working either in an investment or a commercial um, uh, context you know with, with the businesses um, like like those represented today and then I think is being able to describe the societal and the sustainability you know impact opportunity that exists and I think by doing so, we're able to, you know, holistically um, present a, a very broad opportunity that's going to drive engagement and, and adoption um, with the sector. Yep. I think it's interesting that you're focusing there on, on the sort of value that we can create for end customers for the economy. Um, obviously, this is very, very important because, you know, ag tech isn't going to exist in a vacuum where we don't create value for growers. Um, but, you know, I think that one of the things I think would be interesting for us to reflect on is, is sometimes what happens with agri-tech is that it gets lost in the conversation about agriculture and we lose focus of the fact that we're probably digital first and agricultural sector second in the sense that we're creating a sector that has its own value from knowledge-based exports. So um, I think it's very important that we understand the contribution to increasing productivity of agriculture, but perhaps we're not clearly articulating to government, to stakeholders, to investors, the value that we create in knowledge-based exports that exist independently of the sector. I can see lots of nodding of heads going on here. Emma, did, did you want to say something? Yeah, thanks, Roz. Look, I just think that what we, what we need is it needs to actually be a... You know, Australia itself has to be, <clears throat> pardon me, a global advantage. Um, and it's not enough just to say that, you know, we've been historically strong at wheat and sheep and therefore we're going to have a strong ag tech ecosystem. Ag tech and what I do, you know, at AgriDigital and what the team does at AgriDigital is not the same as growing grain. And I do that too. And I can tell you very, very <laughs> much they're two very different things. Um, and we have to stop, you know, Com compounding the problem by seeing agriculture and ag tech, um, you know, as one and the same. I think the reason that Australia has to be a global advantage is it actually has to be an advantage to start a company here. It has to be an advantage to build an ag tech company here. It has to be an advantage to invest in an ag tech company here. So we've got to look at, you know, where we're creating advantage. Um, and when we create that advantage, we will create the value and the return back to whichever stakeholder we're talking about. Fantastic. That's a perfect segue to my friend Phil, uh, fellow director of the Food Agility CRC and chair of the investment committee there, um, because I think one of the issues we often talk about is the magnificent record we have in research terms in both digital kind of based uh, research, but also in agricultural research and the appalling level of translation that we, we often see of taking those results and getting a commercial return and getting impact so, you know, in this world of collaboration that we're describing to accelerate this ecosystem, you know, do you think we can be doing more there? Is that part of our competitive advantage if we can get that collaboration model right? And how do we go about that? Absolutely. The single biggest weakness of our world-class research system is that it's siloed and it sort of keeps itself small, keeps the walls up around um, what it's doing. And um, that isn't helping to sort of build momentum into this, this space. And I suppose I have a slightly different view to 
um, what Emma was saying in that I, I, like I understand making wheat is different from having an ag tech business, but I think the conversation that's interesting for the markets is that there's a profound change happening in the world that agriculture and being good at making food in general um, is, uh, is a part of. And I think companies and countries are going to rise as leaders of that they're going to be fueled by the research systems and the entrepreneurial systems working together uh, with permeable edges. And I think, um, you know, I resonate very strongly with something Matt said earlier, which is that we just have to decide that we want to do this. And that's our biggest challenge because Australia, you know, it kind of, it, it's what Tim was saying, everyone kind of fights with each other uh, and fights over the over the breadcrumbs, um, and that's particularly difficult, you know, as we've articulated earlier. That when the market is small, and there's a small, yeah, you know, there's a small uh, set of resources, then we fight for those resources. But then we keep the resource pool small. So we have this we have this timing now where we have to make more food. We've got sustainability and climate is now at the tip of everyone's tongues. We're talking about it. Policies are changing. Um, we're seeing this emerging manufacturing question mark about what are the things we can make here in Australia. Again, multi-billion dollar industries. When I, when I look at this, this, this um, farm gate target that we have as a country, I just think it's terrible. It's just too small. And uh, we just need to set our aspirations higher and we need to make some new industries and some of the most important new industries that of the world in the next couple of decades are going to be all around how food is made. And that includes everything that we're all doing. And that's why our job together is so important. And we need to work together to deliver on that. And, and um, one final sort of tactical point on that is that I found in, in my work that when people articulate what they're doing in the context of others and that they find out ways of helping other people make money and working together with other people, it's always better. So how do we look at what we do as a bundle of opportunity and value creation with other people? And that's why the CRC is important and it's why our collaboration in general uh, as a community is critical. So a call to collaboration, you know, uh, Justin, you're going to get the last word on this because we're rapidly running out of time. Um, but, you know, just in terms of this, I know that you've been deeply involved in how we actually all work together and building a an ecosystem here in Australia. Um, you know, just interested in your reflections, what you see the biggest priorities for us, practical top three things that we could do that are really going to make a difference. Well, Rose, I think you, you're too kind again. I'm quite simply like riding on your coattails of leadership for, for collaboration on this. Um, so thank you to you for, for being, um, you know, a, a, a lighthouse in this. Um, <clears throat> I think the Phil's comment right there was absolutely on the money. Um, and you know, it's probably a, a, a spin-off of, of what he's doing at main sequence. Like I've got to think about much bigger problems. And, and I think ag tech tends to be confined to be, thought of as, oh, cool, it'll be a technology on farms. So it doesn't really relate to me. Um, uh, and Rob started off you know, this segment um, by, by addressing or perhaps try to reframe the concept in these are huge issues. It's about how we eat. It's about feeding 10 billion people by 2050 with more protein that, quite frankly, we can't do. And that Malthusian trap of literally not having enough food uh, will have extraordinary ramifications through the global markets. And this is a technology problem. Uh, it's a productivity issue that technology can solve. And as a hub globally of you, you know, the, the genesis of so many of the already in this early stage of ag tech global leaders that, are, that have moved over, overseas, some of whom are on this call and some haven't, there's such an opportunity to get behind it and so to cluster together and grow here, to, uh, to have the government understand that this is a source of tremendous investment from overseas and domestically that will produce jobs, that will produce a whole new sector of export. I just think that we are, we're sitting on an absolute gold mine to, to harvest and deliver to the world a major and absolutely critical solution. 
Fantastic. Well, that's a call to action. And just, I think, for all our audience today, um, this has been a fantastic discussion. I want to thank all the panellists. We really are so privileged to have such a, an incredible group of experts discussing this. But um, I think what I wanted to finish up with is watch this space because there's many of us that are working together right now to see how we can actually really take all the magnificent work that's been done over a decade and take it to the next level. Because, you know, ironically in the world of COVID, we are kind of at this inflection point. We've got new opportunities as well as challenges. And one of our greatest strengths is our ability to collaborate. We know that that is the key of innovation. And ag tech businesses are going to be the way that we get innovation and ideas from, from that inspiration into something that is practical, that both builds businesses, jobs and investment and impact economically, socially and environmentally. So watch this space because we may well be coming knocking on your door soon to help us in this push um, to actually really build this very recognised innovation network here uh, around uh, Agritech. Uh, so thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much for the Food Agility uh, Summit, CRC Summit uh, 2000 and 21 uh, for this terrific panel and opportunity. And we look forward to engaging with you more in the future. Thank you all the panelists.